everyone for their attendance. Obviously, the first thing on our agenda is the City Council reconciliation. And I'm pleased to say that the Vice Mayor and I, as we have in the past, have got a letter to present to you all, and I will read it so the public will have the precise information. I can pass those to him, please see if they're enough. I've got one for you here, Ruth. Let me make sure there are enough of them, please. And then I will re read the letter because I want you all to follow along. Thank you. So there are enough? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, dear city council members, after lengthy discussions with you and listening to the public input at the various public meetings, town halls, public hearings, and by email, we would like to recommend adopting the operating budget in CIP with the following adjustments. For our dedicated city and school employees, we suggest increasing the proposed pay increase from 3% to 4%. The required VRS increase and its tax offset of 1.34% would remain on July 1st. We will need to delay the proposed 1.66 increase from July 1st to October 1st and increase the amount to 2.66 for a total of 4%. The delay frees up some existing funding but the city and schools identified an additional $4.5 million through a combination of reductions to various accounts, reduced debt service costs resulting from the recent bond sale, and additional revenue due to better than expected collections. This strategy requires reducing the city's portion of the six cents tax increase by 0.31 cents from 2.2 cents to 1.89 cents and increasing the school's portion by the same amount from 2.0 to 2.31 cents. The city's loss of revenue will be offset by reductions in our debt service costs and health care budget. We would be remiss if we did not point out that delaying the increase until October 1st will result in a rollover cost into fiscal year 2017 of approximately $6 million for city and schools, which is not addressed in the shifting of salary increase. Delay the implementation of the proposed $1 per room night charge from the November 1st to January 1st, 2016. This will reduce the funding to the Tourism Investment Program by $214,566, but will not impact the Arena Infrastructure Projects, 19th Street Infrastructure Improvements, the Arena Infrastructure Development Onsite, and the Arena Infrastructure Offsite. As you recall from our briefing on the Arena, related infrastructure projects, a switch of funding in the CIP between the two projects is recommended, which better aligns the funding with the scope of work, but does not increase the overall cost of the projects. Funding for the EMS department is recommended to increase by $225,815. This will provide an additional 1.7 FTEs to enhance lifeguards at Sandbridge Beach, two additional zone cars, and matching funds of $75,000 to the Rescue Squad Foundation to ensure we continue to attract and retain qualified volunteers. Provide $5,000 to the Green Ribbon Committee for their proposed awards program. Provide Children's Hospital of the King's Daughters, CHKD, $100,000 for their building fund at the Princess Anne Complex. Provide an additional $500,000 to fund the Biomedical Initiative, bring this funding up to a total of $1 million for fiscal year 2016. Fund $77,424 for one additional auditor position in the City's Auditor Office based on the recommendations of the Audit Committee to address increasing workloads. Add one position and $103,033 to the Aquarium's fiscal year 2016 operating budget based on the ordinance the City Council approved on April 7, 2015 to provide this position through the end of fiscal year 2016. This position is fully funded by the Aquarium Foundation. Also, the, for the Aquarium, add $1.1 million to the Marsh Pavilion Enhancement Project 3-028 to provide for the design of Phases 4 and 5. Funding would be from public facility bonds and a $250,000 reduction from Aquarium Building Systems and Facility Infrastructure Project 3-146. The details for the funding sources and the adjustments are identified on the first attachment project sheet shows the final funding for the arena infrastructure projects are also attached. On the issue of light rail, we have a public hearing tonight to receive community input and are scheduled to select a locally preferred alternative on May 12th which will be on our agenda prior to the vote on the operating budget and CIP. In discussing the proposed changes, we have notified the staff that they may need to be prepared to make adjustments to the ordinances based on our LPA decision. For you. now, no adjustments are recommended pending that guidance. We also suggest that before any advanced production orders placed on rail vehicles, that a separate vote be taken by the City Council to authorize this action. 
Finally, with the reallocation of a portion of the ARP dedication <coughs> supporting the realization of light rail, we should establish an annual review process to assess potential revenue adjustments should future ARP demands increase. We want to thank the public who came out to the various town hall meetings and public hearings to offer their comments on the fiscal year 2015-16 operating budgets and CRP, as well as staff for their efforts to provide answers to our various questions. If you have any questions, please contact us directly. Signed by the mayor and the vice mayor. And you have the impact on how the monies were derived. We hope that we can get support for the, as recommendations. Yes, sir. I just have a couple of questions on this, and I would like to cover my own alternative. Absolutely. First of all, the money identified for the pay raises, as I look through here on the spreadsheet, are any of those dollars recurring revenues? It doesn't appear to be that that's the case. I've got the answer coming for you right now. And if you could delineate which ones are recurring and which ones are not. Um, the $473,000 in telecommunications, that tax, that revenue has been doing better than we had anticipated when we put the proposed budget together. It will result in about an increase of $700,000 additional revenue, and that's an ongoing source. Is that, is that on this sheet? It's on the very top line. I see 473, but is that the, the other part is I was just getting there. The other part is um, under the school operating school share of the telecommunications tax. Those two numbers together will make 700,000. Then going down to the cuts in cost, those are permanent reductions in the city's employer's portion of the budget for health care. It does not change the premiums that employees were just notified or the contribution level to those employees. There was extra money when we went back and reanalyzed that once the council was comfortable with the 16 premium share. Annual recurring savings. Yes, yes, sir. Okay. And the debt service savings is also an annual recurring savings of the currently issued debt. Now, obviously, it will issue debt next year, and that debt service will go up. But that will be based on the new issuances that will happen next spring. So those are the major sources. We reduced the general fund reserve for contingencies a little bit, too, to provide some extra funding. Can you, is the school board going to provide us before Tuesday a detailed delineation of the things that they say they could take a permanent cut and a reduction so we can make sure the public knows what they think they can do without since they claim their budget was underfunded by $20 million? I'm just interested how they had that available. Mr. Hunsaker is in the process of identifying the new numbers for the categories that council will adopt. But next will he be able to tell us the specific things they deleted? To I would Jennifer? suspect he will. Well, I would hope so. Okay. They, they claim they were $20 million short. Now they have some hundred thousand they don't need. So I'm just curious how I, I, that happened in four days. I'm <laughs> sure they'll have a very good answer. Anything but else? If you could just give me the total amount and then show, because I think what's unclear is will those revenues grow at the same rate over the five-year period as the liability that we're incurring. And remember, the liability is bigger 12 months out than it is that we're funding no, in this no budget. The, and the, there must be a, a deficit going in the out here. And the mayor mentioned that in his letter about the $6 million rollover from the higher pay raise um, in October. We have $6 million city and schools that we'll have to address going into next year's budget. $6 million structural deficit, just want to make sure. The rollover doesn't sound nearly as clear <laughs> as $6 million shortfall. Well, I wasn't trying to hide I know, that but I meant was, but it is a distinguishing difference between those two things. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I would like to do, obviously I found some more revenue, so maybe my things could even get better between now and TZ. But I'd like to talk a little bit about how we could not have a tax increase and how we could not have a decal increase and how we could live within our means which I think is what the public really expects of us, I think. And I did email all this to you in advance, and I post this frequently on my web pages, so I don't think there's any real surprises. As you know, back in 2012, 2013, we adopted the budget. The school board asked for six cents. When we had this reconciliation, that very day was the first time the two cents thing came up. We took two cents for partially for roads and partially for line of duty and left the school board with one-time money, which created at that point in time about a $9.6 million structural deficit because they had asked us to close the gap. We didn't close that gap totally. We, in fact, used two cents for some other things. So this, their structural deficit in part was they advertised to cover it. We used it for something else. So I think we morally owe them that two cents back when it comes time looking. That's my view. So, in my part, I removed the light rail funding in total. 
I also found alternate source for line of duty and put that two cents into and back to the school system, provide them recurring revenue to address a structural shortfall that we created back in the 2012-2013 budget, a budget I did not vote for. I then went out also to look if, and we're not doing this, if we go back, and I provided, we have 270 positions on average vacant at any one time. 28% of those have been vacant for more than a year. One's been vacant since 2010, and yet we 100% budget for those kind of positions. Discounting the enterprise fund, that's public utilities, stormwater management, if we were to take only a 2% lapse rate, and our average attrition is 4.5, still leaving a 2.5% trade space in execution, that generates $6.4 million. You take the money from Agricultural Reserve and the, and the open space, which I'm now not spending on light rail because we're far from getting the decision. I'll come back to that. You're about $10.4 $10 million. There's another two cents that has been met. Then I went through and identified... Uh, if you go back and fund all new vacancies, you go back and fund, you eliminate some funding in total for some of those positions that have been vacant for more than a year but less than two years, you can come back and hire 10 new officers, and you can hire six new firefighters by reallocating existing vacancies, something that I talked about at one of our workshops. I thought we were not doing what we could do to take administrative type of vacancies more than a year old and allocating them back to where we have immediate needs. And I would argue, even if this is the budget that we go, I would still say we should adopt the lapse employment to reduce the burden, and we should still go after these vacancies to allow us to offer police officers and to offer firefighters. Furthermore, I have in the, my proposal to create an ordinance whereby the people with the pawn shop operations would cover the costs that we incur, just like people do with stormwater management, the costs that we incur for the operation and administration of pawn shops. If you look at that, that would allow us to free up, what, three officers, because we'd have the funding for those three that are in the budget base, would give you three officers to hire. Once again, putting more police officers on the street, I don't think that's a bad thing. I would still recommend, I'm not voting for this, but if you're all going to go down this route, I still would say that would be a, an amendment you might want to consider in terms of what we're trying to do, adding police officers and something I think that we're short. When it came to body cameras, I went after the $485,000 that we were moving as a capital improvement from the Rosemont SGA, since it was in this very room that the deputy city manager said, before we ever went beyond the southern eastern terminus, of 1A, the DEIS that we're now dealing with would be expired. I think those were his exact words. And so therefore, I think in light of the fact we're a long way for record of decision, I think a higher priority for that capital expenditure would to be to buy the body cameras. And within the 10 positions created, you would have the positions to deal with the administration piece of the, the, the video. And that was something that I think that we need to do. I think body cameras for our police officers is a high priority. And I think any budget that does not include that in today's environment is not doing the right thing that we can do when we have so much cash on the table, and especially when I saw this recent amendment of where some of the cash is going, I clearly think public safety ranks higher than some other things that were in here. Furthermore, I didn't have to my benefit at the time, because it wasn't made visible by the city manager apparently to all, how much savings we had from some other initiatives as I was digesting that budget, or I would be making further amendments and plan to make those before the final vote on Tuesday. So I think that we can have a budget that works without a six-cent tax increase. I walked it through in a spreadsheet. My ordinance shows exactly dollar for dollar how to make that happen, and not out of things that people will miss, not a cut in service, a change in priorities. Now, getting back to the issue that's before us, because I think they're intricately linked, why did I say not to fund the, rec not to fund the multimodal light rail? First of all, I, I have probably studied that report probably more than anyone around this table, I suspect. I can probably quote some of it, chapter, page, verse. And, we have, and I have filed a very extensive critique with the working group on that report with help from universities and people outside this area to look at that. I think when you look at that, when you look at alternative 1A is the only one that we're, that's proposed that we adopt. When you go and look at the study, first of all, HRT recognizes that rapid bus transit was, under, was overpriced 
because they put in bus maintenance facilities and a lot of other costs that you would not incur if you only did 1A. So I think it's not unlikely that when the FTA looks at all the, the corrected numbers, that light rail might not look so favorable as we think. And this body itself does not have the benefit of that corrected pricing. And rapid bus transit moved more people, moved more people than rapid bus. But I won't go into all the report here. I provide, well, maybe the city clerk will send a copy of that report so you can read it for yourself. But the key is we are a long way from a record of decision, a long way. Our selection here on the 12th, if we make one, which I think we're out of sync, and I've expressed that. As a matter of fact, this body was never actually asked if we wanted to have this public hearing. We just got one. We had a robust debate and left that with some uncertainty if we were going to have one. But I understand someone's chosen one for us, and I think somewhat abused the process to do so. But that's a debate for out there on another day, and we'll have that debate out there. But. Uh, but when you walk that down, they got to adjudicate all the comments for the DEIS. FTA has to look at all those and make sure HRT's adjudication is prompt and right. And, and then they got to do the FEIS. That's an FTA responsibility, not HRT's. They then have to issue that FEIS for a 30-day public comment period after they've done all that. And then they still have to then deliberate all that before they even get to a record of decision. We could well be halfway through, all the way through this budget cycle before that record of decision is ever issued. And that's a real possibility. They're not guaranteeing us a timeline by which that will be done. So I think to tax the public and to take out that much money out of the private sector, which is a tax, you multiply effect, you're equivalently taking out $2 for every dollar you take is being, a multiplier effect, being withdrawn from the private sector. So now we're constituting a drag factor on an already stifled economy for a potential and collecting money in advance of need. I just think that's wrong. That's wrong. And we all know that the state can't release their rail money until they have a record of decision. I take this to be, though I'm not certain because it didn't use those exact words, but I'd ask for a clarification. Does this amendment mean that we won't be issuing the procurement until FTA actually issues a record of decision. That's unclear. What is, can I ask as to that we take a separate vote? Does that mean our separate vote would happen in advance of the record of decision? The separate vote is purely on the rail cars. Right. But would that decision be made in advance of the record of decision? Yes. So, yeah, and I think that is a misjustice to go out and buy something before the FTA ever officially says it's eligible for state funding, which is key to the Secretary of Transportation releasing their money. And I realize he's holding this harmless, but I think it's reckless. Reckless is the only word I could use, and it's not a good use. And I don't think it's in keeping with our fiduciary responsibilities. I understand the political aspects of it. I don't understand the fiduciary stewardship aspect of it. I think it's lacking. Um, also, the other aspect that my ordinance does, it does not allow us to increase the debt limit going from 2800 to 3000 per capita, which this budget does do. So I want the public to understand at a time of declining incomes, real incomes, so we're not as wealthy as when the policy was adopted at 2800 The manager, by his own letter, says the economy is going to grow at 1.5%, anemic at best, that revenues are not going to keep pace We'll be looking at tax increases every year, if you read the five-year forecast correctly, that we're increasing our, our ability to borrow when our citizens have less capacity to pay. I don't know anyone in their own household who would do that kind of policy adoption and call that responsible. <coughs> now, furthermore, we don't need to raise the policy for the first year of the capital improvement plan. And by rephasing some of the debt, because there is a lot of unexercised debt when you look at the capital improvement plan of debt unobligated, by shifting the debt some issues to the right, we don't need to increase our per capita debt limit unless we plan to be borrowing a lot more money than what's anticipated in the CIP. And if that's the case, we haven't been honest with the public as to what our real intentions are. So I just think we haven't done our due diligence that I often said, until the city's budget is as tight as families' budgets, why are we raising their taxes? And I think I've clearly laid out that it's not. We are taxing people at least $6.4 million for people we're never going to pay. That we are never 
going to pay, and yet we're asking to raise their taxes, and we haven't even done that kind of reducing the expense and burden on the public. I realize each of you have to go out and explain yourselves, so do I. You have to make your own judgment, but I'll be explaining to the public why I do not share the judgment of my, and I will be putting this, and this will be, get the changes to Dana before Wednesday, and this will be on the agenda, and at least I can tell people what I would have voted yes for, and why, and why I'm voting no, and what we're being presented, and I thank you for the opportunity. And, you. I, and respect your comments. John, are you okay with the uh, recommendation by the Vice Mayor and I? Sure. Jim? Rosemary? Um, for the most part, um, John, and maybe we can look at this in the next few days. Sure. John made a, a, a really good point about the police officers. And, and if we've got some positions that haven't been funded in years, maybe we should relook look at those. Cause in well, fact, I, I, I liked have, what I he said about the, uh, if we could go ahead Lewis. and charge for uh, the uh, pollen brokers and green that to was Lewis three earlier and said if there's a way we can hire some more police officers yeah. I'd really like to see us do that well let's put up our sleeves in the next a way before that Tuesday we can get some more police officers on the street I think his suggestion on the pollen broker thing was a good one well Dana can share with you because he has them I actually when you look at that 270 list by date he has the list of the positions that I actually identified. I tried to be somewhat judicious in looking at admin we look at those and but We'll look at that on tomorrow. I'd, I'd rather see us actually hire some police okay. officers that we need, and obviously Captain Severa has told us that he needs them. Right. Okay, other than that, okay? I'm not Captain Severa. I've been known him too long. Yeah. <laughs> We've been friends. Right. I've actually been friends since he was Lieutenant Severa. So. MP of Severa. When I so you're okay <laughs> with trying to get the additional police officers? Lewis is already signed. Ben, are you okay? I'm okay. Uh, I do agree with you, though. I would like to see the amendment okay. for the pollen broker. I'm Bilio. Okay, with you. Okay, John, we know. Bobby? Um, can I make a statement? Oh, absolutely. You know, I'll tell you what. I, this is America. I know. <laughs> and Virginia Beach. <laughs> Greatest city in the world. Um, you know, I, I, I would be less than honest to say that I am disappointed and somewhat angered by the process that we are, we've been put in. A uh, couple of my criteria for voting for this particular budget were absolutely no money for light rail, no tax increase, and a respectable raise for the employees. Those were my th three criteria. And I felt it was a little bit just disingenuous in this particular budget cycle to have light rail included when we have not even really discussed it, have the information for it. This reminds me of the Affordable Care Act. Let's go ahead and vote on it before we find out what the real implications are and we know what's going on there. I think there's better ways than light rail, better technology. I articulated it in a uh, op-ed last Saturday. We have not had the discussion. And it's just premature. And what kind of message are we sending to the public if we're you know, just jumping ahead there and not getting the full input yet? Um, you know, but once again, that's been a bias of mine and, you know, that type of thing. I was really struck by the, the one lady at Greenbrier, that, uh, Green Run High School, that said, you know, she's out living her bank account. And one of the things that Rosemary and I did the, um, you know, the green, uh, blue ribbon a couple of years ago, one of the statements that came out of it that we still use in our strategic plan is that we got to make our decisions based on people's ability to pay. And the thing is, I think the public already had a tax increase with the water bills and the trash fees. That's translating to, what, fifteen to $1,800 per year. And, you know, the point is you talk to a lot of people that are really, really stretched in what's going on. You know, it's, you know, I think a lot of people are at the breaking point. I think John has articulated, you know, that we got 40% of the, you know, people in Virginia Beach schools are in subsidized lunches. You know, we're trying to find some ways to, you know, generate income, but the point is, though, we are not sustainable right now. And a lot of the th discussion about light rail is about the future, okay? But my, I respectfully submit that we cannot have a stable future unless we got a sustainable now. And right now, we don't have a sustainable now. And I'm, I'm afraid that this debt that is going to come on could really break the bank and really hurt a lot of other people and affect employee wages down the line. Because once again, we're kind of cannibalizing things from all over, putting it into here. 
what's going to happen when we get this thing up and running? What are the real costs going to be? Uh, let's talk about governance, about, okay, how's this going to operate? How are we going to have our relationship with Norfolk to decide if you know, fees are going to be raised for buses and transportation and, you know, other costs that we're just not aware of yet? So I got a problem with that. But I think the other thing when it comes to the employees, and, you know, when you raise tax, when you're, you know, the assessments go up and you've got to raise taxes to give somebody a raise, I have a problem with that. It really doesn't translate to a 4% raise, does it? Especially when, you know, other things, maybe pensions and everything else is going up. Um, you know, so the point is, though, it, it would have been a lot better. I think, you know, did we have, we actually looked at every conceivable way that we had to reduce, the, you know, the operating budget. And we got some sacred cows out there that we've been talking about, consolidations with the schools and maybe raising some other, you know, important fees. Have we really gone in and found a way to make ourselves this sustainable organization that we have to be for the future, not just for this year, but for the future? So, you know, and, you know, believe me, I, I'm, I'm sure that in many ways the die is cast on this, but I, in conscience, and I say this with due respect to everybody at this table, cannot support this. And, you know, John, I really respect this, but we got we to gotta find a better process to get John type of ideas on the table than the day before reconciliation. You know, I think maybe we got to do something throughout the year, uh, you know, find a way to build a better mousetrap and do this as we go forward. Because I, am, I have a fear of the future that if we keep on losing money from Richmond and the federal government and everything, more and more responsibility is going to come on the localities. It's going to be impossible not to have tax increases in the future, the way things are going. So the point is, though, I respectfully submit that, you know, I am going to vote no on this budget as written. And... Um, you know, I just think that we got to find a much better way, you know, to demonstrate to the public that we're showing the due diligence that we have to show. And, you know, the point is, um, you, know, I, you know, light rail is about the future. I admit that. And we got to do something. we got to do something about transportation. I'm just not sure it's light rail. And, you know, forgive me for going on, but I figure I'd owe you all an explanation. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Special comments. Bob, are you okay with the letter? Well, if I can't not say something here after, you know, I guess it's the optimist uh, following a couple pessimists here. I really am a lot more optimistic about the future. I, you know, I, I don't fear the future. I think we have to prepare for the future, and I think that's what we're trying to do. Um, the, the, the items in the uh, tra uh, light rail issues, and I spent some time with uh, the budget office yesterday, uh, will be going into this multimodal transportation fund. And if we decide next year not to go forward with the light rail, then that money will be there to shift to other transportation items, which I think is extremely critical. Uh, so th the fact that we are, at this point, putting some money in those accounts so that they will be there, not only to send the message to the state and others that we are serious, but it also, um, uh, prepares us for those uh, spending elements when they are needed. I kind of think back to the uh, Lake Gaston project and the fact that we started charging for the drainage fixture units in the late 80s, and we didn't get Gaston until the mid to late 90s, and by that time we had it paid for. <laughs> uh, a pretty good thing. Uh, and so I, I think it's not a bad idea. We went that, through legal battles and everything. Oh, boy, did we ever I mean, do that. But we made a commitment we were going to get it done. And I think the very fact that, you know, we, we need to, to plan for the future, it's sort of like what we do with our families when we think that we might be doing something. We, we begin to uh, adjust our spending to accommodate that so that we can do it if the opportunity arises. And I think that's what we're doing with this proposal as we're going forward, if we do go forward at this point, is that we're going to be finishing the study so that we can determine how much it's going to cost and, and, um, and be prepared uh, to, to deal with it. Another thing that I hope will happen, not only will we be sending the message to the state so that we can um, uh, 
preserve that state funding, which may not come around to us again, is I hope that uh, during this next year, while this work is being done, that we can begin to, to see a little bit more from our, our private uh, property owners in that those areas around the stations uh, of what some of the development might be that they may be willing to do if, in fact, we get the, the, uh, the uh, light rail stations there uh, so that we can know for real whether or not it's going to generate uh, the economic impact that we're hoping it's going to. Um, so I think there are a lot of things that can happen over the next uh, year uh, that will put us in a better position to make the, the uh, final decision at that time. And uh, if we, if everything goes to, um, uh, well, if it doesn't come out the way we'd like for it to, uh, and it comes to be something that doesn't appear to be feasible, then we do have the money that we can then divert to other uh, transportation uh, issues, and I think I think this is a, a very important part of this. But you know, we, we're talking all this in this budget about light rail, and the fact that we haven't made the final decision. But uh, you know, the same thing holds true for the arena, and I haven't heard that mentioned. Uh, we really haven't had a, a, a commitment to our term sheet yet, and I think we have set down a lot of things that have to occur in order for us to go forward with the arena. I really don't have a problem with the fact that we are indicating those projects in this budget, uh, even though we haven't made the final decision, uh, because if we decide, if, if the term sheet doesn't materialize as we have required it to, we can simply remove those items from the budget. So having them in this budget, I think with the caveat that, yeah, we haven't yet approved the arena, uh, we, we have to see the term sheet. And, and But if we do, this is how the, the project will be funded. I think we have long had a, a policy that if we're going to do a project, we have, to, we have to identify the funding. And so I think that's what we're doing with both of these issues. Uh, okay, so the public will know, if we do go forward with both of them, where the funding will be. I totally agree with the uh, uh, sustainability issues. I totally agree with the fact that we have to plan for the future. We have to plan for being less dependent on uh, the uh, d uh, defense dollars that we've been getting. I think we're doing this with the biomedical and so forth. And as far as issues like consolidation with schools, my golly, I served on a committee in the early 80s uh, for doing that. We've looked at consolidation with various aspects with the schools, and we have done some over time. It never doesn't mean that we can't still identify some other areas, but we have been doing this. I, I can remember at least three different committees that we had for looking at ways to consolidate with schools, but we always need to be looking to those things, and I think we certainly will continue that. But yes, I'm okay. I do think, and I did go through all that list of, of unfilled positions because we did get that uh, with the answers to our budget. I did notice the one that had been unfilled since 2010. Most of them, though, seem to be uh, since uh, 2000, in 2015 or uh, the latter half of 2014. But if there are some chronic uh, uh, positions that we haven't filled, I certainly have no problem with looking at those as, as a means of maybe coming up with a few uh, more likely to be filled uh, positions. Very good. Then what I'm, and I'll get you just a minute, John, if I may. What I'll do then, um, uh, Mr. City Manager, uh, let's run with what uh, Lewis and I have signed, uh, sent to the council. And if you could see if uh, some of the suggestions that Mr. Moss made and Rosemary and, and Barbara just make the comment about, and, and Ben, if we can find some of his thoughts could result in maybe some more police officers. And we'll get that out as soon as we can, okay? That would be really great. Okay, very good. Okay, can Amelia go? Then oh, you John, I mean, I'll go ahead, Amelia. Um, Please. Two things to do with the cameras that you mentioned. That is important if we can begin looking at the cost for that. And one thing, I did have an opportunity to go from 1999 to seeing what happened in Denver and coming back in about 2013 and seeing the immense economic growth along that corridor. It was amazing that the mobility for people to ease, and this is what we don't have here. A lot of people end up saying we're trying to get from this job to that, from home to the jobs. And they still have problems because we don't have the mass uh, transportation. We don't have these in place. And this planning and moving forward and especially mentioning that we will listen 
to the public hearing tonight here that alternative. I think it's important that we as a city, the largest uh, city for Virginia, needs to lead. And so I'm just mentioning that because I think this is a, a good budget and I like the way the reconciliation went, that you have a bid from each person that has been put together. John, then we'll wind up. Uh, I certainly respect Ms. Hemley's comments, but I would not characterize my comments as pessimistic, which is how they were characterized. I think everyone of us are respected of our own views. I don't think it's pessimistic to stand up for people whose incomes have fallen in real terms, and we're asking them for another two to $500 a year out of their income, and they're making a sacrifice so government can grow at their expense. I don't think it's pessimistic to be a good steward of the public's dollar. I don't think it's pessimistic to resist funding things with one-time obligations that create $6 million bills next year. I don't think any of those things are pessimistic, and I wouldn't characterize other people's comments as optimistic or speculative. I think all of us look at the facts and draw our own conclusions, and I just want to stand up and say, I don't think it's pessimistic. It's my view of realism, just as I think Mrs. Hanley's comments are her view of realism. And I just want to make that clear for the record. Thank, Thank you very much. Shane, have you read the letter? Are you okay? I have read the letter. Um, I am fine with it. it. It makes me happy to, to see that, or makes me more comfortable to see that the, the rail cars will be a little bit later date as opposed to up front. And I'm happy to see that we've given the, the teachers and firemen more than the 3% that we were originally budgeting. Yeah. Rosemary. Uh, one other question. Um, I think it's another question. We've, we've had a lot of discussion about the city services bill. Are we still going to be looking at changing it to a monthly bill? I thought that I thought we gave direction to Dave Anson to go ahead and get it done and he could absorb the cost. Okay. So that, did you hear that pretty clearly, Mr. Spore? I heard a lot of discussion. I didn't hear any direction. This is I'm gonna be glad to do whatever you want to do, but so <laughs> well, what I thought well, I'm sorry. So I I mean I think that's a really important issue and We've, we've tried to look at this at so many different angles, and, and I appreciate y'all bringing it up at your public hearings, and there's, there's no easy answer for it. Um, but I just think that 60-day cycle is I th I think such a monthly a huge bill is what burden, we should and, do. And, maybe, and there's different ways to cut it, and, and I think John Earn and I kind of think, well, maybe it can be, it doesn't have, the meter doesn't have to be read every single month, That's but it could be billed every month. Well, I think it's been made pretty clear now. Is it made very clear, Mr. Spore, that we want to try to get monthly there? You just go around the table and well, be I, great. What I heard, though, at that discussion, because of the comments that John Rosary made, is yes, we wanted to go to monthly, but we <coughs> wanted someone to come and tell us why it required hiring another set of meter readers to read it. I think that's where I think someone owed us to come back and say, what are the alternatives we, other than having to read the meter again we, for a date? was what I thought we left it was to come back and show us how we could do it without having to meet the reader twice. Okay, I remember that discussion. We can come back and talk about options. Okay, we, we want to do something of that pretty quick, please. But that's what I recall. Thank you. And maybe we need to announce that. Okay. So Because there's a lot of frustration with that. Okay, I think Dave Hanson's done some work on that. Maybe Jim could get with him in a few minutes. Before, maybe we can talk about it later on. All right. Well, I certainly... One last question on that regard, because you mind me? We were supposed to come back with street sweeping as what, the, so I assume we're not going to commit on buying the street sweepers and the positions until we get the RFP and all, we have and come back and tell us which is the best answer. That's that correct. Else. Just want to make sure, not to be in the budget, I just want to make sure that's an understanding we're all operating under. Yes, sir. Hey, let me just make a comment about body cameras because it, it's been mentioned several times. I think the chief was pretty clear that, that he does not want to, to purchase them right now until He's had a chance to evaluate them with the other large city chiefs around the country. The technology on them is anything from something the size of this to something that's a buttonhole that you can't see. And, and there's pluses and minuses for both of those. And, and I think with not only our neighboring cities but other large cities going to that way, He's in a unique position to to actually evaluate that. I don't think he's made I, a recommendation. Yeah, he, he hasn't. I mean, his recommendation is give me a year, and then I'll probably be coming back for it. And then we also have the issue of the Commonwealth's attorney indicating he needs additional FTEs for it, which, you know, that may, and there seems to be a little bit of a disconnect between the police and Commonwealth's attorney on that. So I think, I think rather than 
then setting aside money to buy these things is probably something we need to wait until we actually have the, um, the details on it. Great. Other questions or comments before we move on? Okay, we'll move on with the city manager's briefing. Green Sea Plan, Clay Burnett. And I'll be right back. Clay <laughs> Burnett. Oh, Clay. Not far from Sandbridge. Thank you. Shannon, thanks for coming. Hi, son. <laughs> that, that shark's been up and down the <laughs> North Carolina coast. I thought we were going to get one thing online about three weeks. Mr. Mayor and members of council, the this is a second briefing on this subject. Uh, Clay Burnick gave you a preliminary briefing several months ago, and the direction was to go out and talk to Chesapeake and Kirk Tuck County, see where everybody was, finalize the draft, and then come back. So this is the comeback uh, briefing. This is pretty exciting. Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm ready for an exciting briefing. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll do our best. All right. Uh, what is this plan? I guess is the first thing I wanted to kind of go over to refresh everybody's memory. Uh, it's a regional collaboration that we've put together with our neighboring communities of Chesapeake and Currituck County to protect and manage a system of resources in an area we call the Green Sea. Uh, it, it basically in Virginia Beach includes, and I'll show in a moment, the North Landing River. Uh, the whole purpose of the plan is to really focus on environmental stewardship and enjoyment of the area to enhance our tourism and economic development potential in that area, and last but not least, to create a non-governmental entity that would oversee, manage, and promote this area among the three communities. Uh, <coughs> how could this plan impact our localities? Uh, and these are just some, some suggestions that have come out from a lot of the stakeholder meetings we've had in each of the communities. Increasing awareness of these waterways, uh, improving water access, improving water quality, increasing recreation, promoting health and wellness, increasing tourism, particularly ecotourism potential in our shoulder seasons, uh, enhancing property values, having collaboration on events and festivals, and uh, looking at education, and also ensuring, I think most importantly down here at the bottom right, ensuring no long-term capital improvement expenditures to the cities and to the county. Uh, it aligns very well with our adopted plans and policies in Virginia Beach, our southern watersheds plan that we worked on with Chesapeake with the Hampton Roads Planning District about 15 years ago, uh, our outdoors plan, the comprehensive plan, our bikeways and trails plan, the state's outdoors plan, and then the comprehensive plan in Chesapeake and a Moyoc small area plan that Currituck County has. Uh, so greenways and blueways basically are lands and waterways that are designated because of their trail connection, uh, either for pedestrian use or bikes, if it's along upland areas, or it could be along the waterway with canoes and kayaks. And they become kind of the, the spine that holds this whole area together and, and creates opportunities to link the points together. Uh, the name was arrived at primarily because between the three communities, we have three different big waterways, the Northwest River in Chesapeake, the North Landing in Virginia Beach, and then down in Currituck County, Tulls Bay and Northern Currituck Sound. So coming up with a common name was the first challenge, and we chose Green Sea because uh, when the boundary was surveyed between the colonies, they discovered that the vegetation of this area, when the wind would blow, waved kind of like the surface of water would be with waves and, and look like a sea, so that's where the name came from and it stuck. Um, a lot of people in this been, been in this area, even more than uh, going back to, to BC time with, with Native American cultural groups, pre-colonial era, a lot of rich farmland and wetlands. There was an important Revolutionary War battle at Great Bridge, not to be outdone by the skirmish in Kempsville, I might have to add. And then also uh, the Dismal Swamp and Albemarle and Chesapeake Canals opened up that area really to market originally, and then later we came with railroads opening up the area. 
And uh, today, those waterways are designated as part of a, a national park service system called the uh, Southeast Coast Saltwater Paddling Trail that ultimately will run from Virginia all the way to Florida, kind of like an Appalachian Trail version along the shoreline. Up close and personal, a lot of the area looks like this picture. And many people would think, well, how are we going to really make this a, a recreational opportunity? Uh, but there are some really unique things about this area, and there are places where we can, we can highlight on that. This kind of shows the location of those three watersheds, the uh, kind of teal color being the Northwest River, the lime green being uh, <coughs> the North Landing River, and then the salmon color being Tulls Bay and Northern Kurtuk Sound. And that's the area that the plan would cover initially. There has been some interest expressed in Chesapeake to maybe expand this later to include the Dismal Swamp area, and then uh, also in Virginia Beach to maybe expand it to include the Back Bay area, and in Currituck to expand it to include more of Currituck Sound. But we thought this is a big enough piece to start with. Uh, the mission and vision in the plan is to conserve, protect, and manage open space lands in this area for enjoyment of future generations and create a system of resources around the things that have already been done, uh, looking at stewardship, protection, and enjoyment, and then creating this nonprofit partnership. Some of the existing resources, uh, the map up here kind of shows the patchwork quilt of properties that are already protected in this area, and there are over 56,000 acres of lands that are either protected by the federal government, state government, local government, or nonprofit groups like the Nature Conservancy between the three communities. So we don't have to look at land acquisition to make this happen. Um, there are a lot of unique natural resources in this area, and it's a very important area and historically has been for waterfowl, particularly uh, migrating birds and, and particularly uh, ducks. Uh, Ducks Unlimited was started nationally in Currituck County, just as an example of that. In Virginia Beach, just as an example of this, there are over eight natural heritage wetland communities. Six of these are rare in Virginia, include things like Atlantic White Cedar Swamps and wind tide marshes that have grasses in them that were the northern limit for them. They're usually found in the Everglades. Um, 13 rare animal species, two of them are rare globally that live in Virginia Beach. And again, I'm thinking it's very unusual to have this kind of unique ecosystem within, you know, a half hour drive of a place like Town Center or the Oceanfront. Many communities around the country would, would die to have this kind of opportunity at their doorstep. And then when you get to plants, the, the amount of rarity really opens up, at least 35 rare plant species. Four of them are rare globally in this area. Some of the influences on this, uh, it's located in a, an increasingly suburbanized area in the northern and western portions of the watersheds. Uh, as you move south, of course, it remains more rural. We do have development pressure on these resources, not only from direct development, but from runoff and water quality issues. It's located in the ITA between Fentress and o Oceana. It's part of the Intercoastal Waterway, and we have more traditional activities like commercial fishing and forestry and farming activities as you go south. We did an analysis of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats for this area, and these are just some of the bullets that you have in front of you that kind of summarize those points in particular. In terms of strengths, there's a lot of ecological biodiversity. A lot of the land, as I mentioned, is already in public ownership. Uh, there is a dedication to stewardship, not only among the agencies there, but among the major landowners, the farming community in particular. We have a water co use conflict agreement already between Chesapeake and Virginia Beach. And there's a lot of historic and cultural heritage in this area, along with the natural heritage very unique kind of area in terms of views and vistas. Some of the weaknesses, while well, we have a lot of this property, it's not contiguous. So creating connections either by water trails or upland trails is very important. A lot of the wetlands areas are not suitable for traditional recreation. That's kind of an understatement. But uh, these areas are very unique and uh, for, for more of a, a natural experience, somebody who wants to go out on a trek or an outdoor adventure, to be able to do that in a community that also has a major 
tourism resort area with the ocean front, the bay front, and sand bridge as well, it, it's really unique to have that kind of variety. <coughs> there are some conflicts between motorized and non-motorized water users. And some of the opportunities um, in our current plans, we have called for development long-term of an Indian River Road greenway, a corridor that would link Stumpy Lake to the Back Bay area. There are some hiking trail opportunities in upland areas, opportunities for platform camping, uh, where people could take a water trail and stop every 20, 30 miles and, and make a stop. Other parts of the country do this. This could be a regional attraction, not for Hampton Roads region, but really for the Mid-Atlantic. You don't have opportunities like this anywhere else in the Mid-Atlantic. You have to travel to southern Georgia and to Florida to really experience some of these kinds of things. Some of the threats, we've already talked about those. Primarily the biggest threat is if we do try to develop more of a regional strategy to, to use this area, we have to make sure we don't exceed the carrying capacity of the resource. We don't want to love it to death, and that's going to be really important. In putting together the plan, we have spent close to two years meeting with stakeholder groups in all three communities. Uh, the plan has been broken into a series of seven key components looking at administration of the area, how we can continue to consolidate land protection, promote the area with branding and marketing and ecotourism as a unified area and so that it becomes known for what it is, uh, managing those unique resources, using opportunities for education and outreach, and then developing a series of facilities through this partnership umbrella by able to go after grants that we would not be able to successfully compete with as individual communities. By partnering together, we've got a lot more power to do that. Uh, our next steps, we uh, take this plan to Planning Commission for consideration on May 13th, and then with their recommendation, bringing that back to you for adoption in June. We're meeting with the Currituck County Board of Commissioners on June 1st to review the plan uh, one last time, and they're looking at endorsement of the plan as well, or adoption, and then also the same thing with Chesapeake City Council. We've met with the manager and senior staff and did an information briefing for the City Council in Chesapeake in their informal session, too. We have a question, Mr. Jones. Yes, sir. Could you go back show us on a map exactly where this, this is? Yes, sir. <coughs> I apologize, it's taking me a moment to go back here on this, get there. Just to orient again, this would be Virginia Beach and Chesapeake and Currituck. The teal area is the Northwest River watershed. The green would be the North Landing. And then the salmon color would be the Currituck Sound area we're talking about. So basically, uh, on the south, it would run as far south as uh, about where Coinjock is, along the road to the Outer Banks. And north, it would extend along West Neck Creek, as far north as about Dam Neck Road. So it's a, it's a pretty substantial area. Looks like it's going further west than Currituck. That's why I was asking. Well, the, the watershed actually does take in most of Currituck County, which runs over to here. It doesn't quite get into Camden County and then picks up into uh, to southern Chesapeake, out around Hickory and, and northwest area. You know, what comes to my mind, and Barbara, this is probably more, you know more about this than I do, but it seems to if we can get to the stakeholders, I see opportunities here. And, you know, and I mean, I've seen business opportunities. Yes, sir. And, and I think the sooner we can get to the stakeholders, uh, I, you know, I can see tours, I can see hunting, I can see the fishing, uh, the bird watching. I mean, I'm just the few minutes we've had this presentation, that's popping in my head. And to the point, I guess we ought to be figuring out how you're going to monitor that and make sure the people that can get in there, it'll be successful. That's exactly the focus. One of the things that came out very clearly in the stakeholder meetings we had and working with the communities is everybody really liked the concept, but they did not want to create a new level of government or create new positions or structuring government to do this. 
So the idea quickly evolved to create a partnership nonprofit group that maybe would have some jumpstart efforts to it, similar to how, as an example, Virginia Beach helped jumpstart Lynn Haven now eight, ten years ago. Uh, we provided some initial startup support, and then when they were able to stand on their own, then that, that partnership, of course, is still there, but, but they don't rely on the city for those kind of resources. Each of the communities is looking at what kind of things they might bring to the table on that in terms of loan of staff or maybe facility where an office could be or some things like that to help get it started. And then we kind of sever that, and then this group becomes the guiding force to make that all come together. I guess where I've come from is if you get this, uh, some potential businesses yes. going, I think you'd get that, you know, I think you'd have uh, things moving pretty quickly, and also money would be starting to be generated. That'd get everyone happy. And and that's that's the the partnership idea behind this is that we we would provide some support to that, but the partnership would actually be made up of those local business okay, community got leaders. Got it. I, I didn't and uh, each each of the uh, communities is is helping us to identify those. In Virginia Beach, we're we're coming up with a, a good list of folks. Chesapeake is doing likewise, and okay. Currituck too. Great. Any other questions? Amelia? Just asking, you mentioned about the press, where you talked about the caring. <coughs> Can you um, elaborate on that? Sure. I think the, the, the real challenge here will be to take an area that, that has a lot of fragility because of the resources that are out there and make it more accessible to the public but not overburden the resource so that you damage it. So you have to find that tipping point where enough people can enjoy it but not destroy the the area at the same time thank you Barbara. Uh, well it's really been uh it took a little longer than than uh we thought when it, it started but it sort of kept growing and i think that's been a, a very good thing uh, this is one of those good things that's happening and i think we can feel really good about it uh, but i think this opportunity that we have with the uh, the other localities is is extremely good because uh Actually, you know, this part of the county uh, kind of identifies more with these areas. And I think we're going to see a lot of participation from uh, Currituck County. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think it's, it's really um, uh, exciting with a lot of opportunities. Plus, we have, you know, we have had participation from the Nature Conservancy because, you know, they purchased a lot of property in there uh, in, in Virginia Beach and Chesapeake as well. And so, and I, I won't let them uh, uh, hear the end of it, but the past two Chesapeake Bay uh, calendars have included pictures from this area, which actually flows to the Albemarle. It's not in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. But it just <laughs> got, right. goes to show what, you know, the beauty and, and the uniqueness of the area. And I... You know, it's it's long been uh, been overlooked, and that's not a bad thing because, therefore, it's it's kind of protected itself. But we have to make sure as we go forward, we, as as a clay says, we don't lose <coughs> it to death, and we have this, you know, this oversight and, and appreciation that's built to uh, to recognize what we have and and the importance of uh, of uh, keeping it in the in the uh, situation that it's in. And uh, uh, Calvin and um, uh, Clay had done a wonderful job uh, working with the, the the groups and going out and so forth, and I really appreciate all that you've you've done, and look forward to getting it underway. This is good stuff. One closing comment, and and this is just kind of a pitch on on behalf of Calvin and myself uh, on on working on the plan, and that is, uh, Mrs. Henley has been tremendous in, in giving us some leads on names who may be able to help form that partnership, but. I'm going to expand that request to all of the council if I could and, and among community leaders or business folks that you think might be interested in being a part of this and you have suggestions and names we should it talk to, let me know <laughs> and, and we'll be glad to go on the road and, and start talking to those folks. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. We'll now move to city council liaison reports. We got any liaisons? I'll now move. Oh. Well, the one thing just to mention about the library, to have the state, you, know, you saw that in your report about someone from Virginia Beach winning that award with the library. Huh? I remember what that is about. It was in our write-up. That's all. 
Thank you. Shannon? Um, yourself and I, we, we, Will and I joined the Human Rights, and Bobby joined the Human Rights Commission last week for their uh, annual award. And Amelia, I apologize, Amelia. Uh, uh, joined the Human Rights Commission for their annual awards reception, and uh, it was very moving and very touching. They, they gave an award in honor of, of Myra and um, a few other folks along the way, but uh, it was well attended and a very good reception. Very good. Okay, I will now move to comments. Are, are you on a laser? Comments. Comment. 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 Okay. Council, council, council. I just got to give you a, a little update on Cycle for Survival. Uh, we had our event on Sunday, and it was spectacular. Um, over 400 people came out for a, very, for a first time event. It's amazing. Over 400 people mm -hmm. came out. And we are really Great close cost. to hitting 200,000. So if anybody okay. hasn't given and would like to give us so we could get up to that 200,000, we would really appreciate That's it. That's wonderful. It was great. It was awesome. And um, I'd like to thank Shannon. Shannon came out and worked really, really hard. And Mr. Spore came out and he rode the bike. You want to say anything about it? It was a real uh, good time and uh, for a great cause. It was amazing. Really good, good was on our committee, and Mr. Mayor gave us a donation. We thank you. And we're going to do it next year, and it's going to be bigger and better. And um, I can't tell you, people just have been talking about it because there's never been an event like that here. And the cause is so amazing. It sounded like a great thing. I'm sorry I couldn't get out there. Well, you... We need to have a team for you. Of course, you if year. I pedaled, I'd probably have a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> no. Anyway, uh, Glenn Davis was there, and I don't good, good. Frank Wagner, and uh, well, Frank can pedal. I can pedal. Oh yeah, and the Steph. Uh, okay. Was there as well as Lou Hadon and Bruce Thompson. We had a lot of well, congratulations. And just a lot of really great regular folks. Well, congratulations, so. congratulations. Um, I, I've got a couple of things that I. have and, you know, especially with this conversation going across the country with, with police, um, you know, I was in the uh, Dr. Uh, Enoch Baptist Church, Dr. Daniels. I, I was out there in Western Bayside, and they gave our third precinct captain and the entire third precinct an award for working so well with the community. I also witnessed a um, police department playing a group of young people in basketball, and I'm proud to say our police department won 12 to 8. <laughs> and, uh, not that I was counting, but uh, the funny thing is I wasn't there for that, and I asked them to, I wanted, we had the city camera there, and I asked them to go video it, so they just did, but they didn't do so well when I was there, but but that matter that wasn't the official game. But to see, and they served over 2,500 people. Yeah, close to 3,000. And to see a community working so well together was very, very impressive. And just before that event, I'd also been to uh, Best All Around for adults and for uh, young people. And our police department got a, uh, you know, uh, an award. Again, it was Captain Hebert from the 3rd Precinct, again, for reaching out to the community. But let me tell you what Dr. Daniel did. He called to the television press and asked them to come to that event. And guess what? They had no interest in coming. And this is a sad commentary because let me tell you, when we've got things like this going good in our city and people need to see it, not just our citizens, but, you know, people everywhere need to see that type of interaction with law enforcement and a community, and in a community that six years ago didn't trust a police officer. You know, the amount of trust and respect between the community and the police has just really grown there, and it's a model. And I, I just, it irks the daylights out of me that we couldn't, that, not that I asked, the church asked for the press to come, and the press, referring to the TV press, there was someone there from the Beacon. But, you know, uh, it's a shame we have to bring it up here, but I think it was worth bringing up because we should be very proud of what's occurring out there. 
Right. And I want to just add to that, I came after you had left because of that big funeral they had for the Thorogood, mm -hmm. and that was very well attended. But um, we had mothers, little two, three-year-olds, the younger guys, and I saw the interaction between the police, and like a big family picnic. That's what it looked like. No tension. And I'm sorry that, you know, they didn't see that because the whole city needs to see what's going on there, the churches working together, and everyone in Western Bayside. Well, so, Vice Mayor? I, you've done good, Mr. Vice Mayor. You. But I am going to personally buy a trophy for next year. Police versus the community in basketball. <laughs> <laughs> and each year, you know, they're going to get to take it home. Are you going to play that? <laughs> no, but I've, told, I've already told uh, the police chief to start recruiting. <laughs> I, need, I need to give a shout out to Bobby Dyer, too, because he, he came through the cycle for survival. And I'm sorry, Bobby. Thank you for doing that. That was great. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, let's go to the agenda review, please. Okay, under ordinances and resolutions, uh, anybody have any comments on any of them? I'm going to be abstaining, uh, Mr. Vice Mayor, under um, Ordinance 1, uh, uh, letter C. On the C, under 1. C, and also on... Number three, uh, letter B, please. And I'll submit that to the city clerk. Okay. Only two? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. Any other comments on ordinances, resolutions? All right. Uh, planning, uh, CCW Development Associates Beach District. No issue. That's for that. deferral. John. Yeah, I'm fine with the deferral. Mr. Mr. Vice Mayor, the applicant emailed us. Okay, fine with that. You okay, John? Yes, sir. Okay. That's CCW. Mm -hmm. You'll need to vote to allow it to be withdrawn, though, because it came in after today. Yeah. Do we do that on a consent, Mark, or do we? Yes, sir. Okay. <clears throat> we can do that under consent, though, can't yes, we? Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Uh, this Leonard Lyon uh, application, we're probably going to have a number of people here. I'm trying to find a middle ground with those people. But I don't know whether they're going to or not. But uh, so item three, Atlantic Development Associates and William D. Wood, uh, Lynn Haven District, Mr. Wood. I'm fine with that, sir. And I'll be abstaining on that. Okay, I got that. Okay. Okay, four, Thomas R. and Joan G. Eckert. Uh, that's for deferral to June the 2nd. The request of the applicant. Uh, they're trying to work something out too. Uh, item five: Aaron Holly Conte Acquisitions Beach District. Mr. Ern. I'm fine with that, Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you. Item six: Kroger Limited Partnership Tidewater Investments in Charlie Weaver, Kempsville, Amelia. Yes, I'm fine with that. And I'll be abstaining on that. And item seven, Assembly of Yah, Inc., Kempsville District, Amelia? Yes. Okay. All right. Vice Mayor, we have speakers under the five. Under five, Aaron Holly. We have speakers? In favor or? One, Ms. Messon. Will you let us know if it's yeah. in favor? If it's in favor, we'll leave it on the consent. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, Doki. I tell you what, Council, let's take a 15 minute recess because all we have are appointments and we got dinner coming in. No, because we didn't know how long the reconsider reconciliation was going to be. So let's take, a, a, why don't we start at 4 30? Take 20 minutes? 
and we'll have dinner at five or five ish. A leisurely dinner? Well, I'll yeah. Go up and down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll go to close session later. Let's take the we'll start at four thirty, if that's all right. Can I have one quick word with you? Sure. Uh, Jenny, thanks for coming
for probably all of 10 minutes. Ah. We have enough people to do Yeah, we do. The chair will entertain a motion to recess into a closed session pursuant to the exemptions from open meetings allowed by section 2.2-3711A Code of Virginia as amended for the following purposes, personnel matters. Discussion, consideration of, or interviews for prospective candidates for employment, assignment, appointment, promotion, performance, demotion, salaries, disciplining, resignation of specific public officers, appointees, or employees pursuant to Section 2.2-3711A1 Council appointments, council boards, commissions, committees, authorities, agencies, and appointees. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Yeah. Okay, any discussion? Call the roll, please. Mr. Davenport? Aye. Mr. Dyer? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. 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 Aye.